really probably wasn't on this that Snapchat and I can throw me. You make one national threat. And now you have to book a ticket to a DC. After saying this, now book a straight flight to Pennsylvania and just uh, Okay. <laughs> All right, we are uh, in uh, sixth hour on the 20th of uh, April. All right, well, we left off the other day, man. The uh, country was uh, moving toward war. And I'm, you know, even though we're at the end of the school year, we just have a few days. Uh, I think we're going to get into the war a little bit. And I'm glad about that. But anyway, um, we were talking about Lincoln and the preservation of the Union when we left off the other day. We were talking about what makes great men, you know, the, they view the, tend to view the world in terms of good and evil. It's not that you never compromise, but you never compromise. There are a lot of things you can compromise on, but you don't compromise with evil. And Lincoln was that way. He believed slavery was evil. He believed that it was a threat to the country, to the Union. Uh, and I know people say, well, he should have just ended it automatically. Uh, for example, uh, at Lincoln's cabinet, there were people that said to him, you should have just, you know, with a stroke of a pen in slavery. But Lincoln uh, put forth the argument. He said, you know, I've often considered that, but he said, if I do that, these slaveholding, uh, if I do that now, these slaveholding border states, so that, you know, they're in the balance. They're tipping one way or the other. There are civil wars going on in a couple of those border states. We're waiting to see who's going to win. If I free all the slaves, that would give uh, the secessionist elements in those states the right to secede, and they would secede, and if the border states secede, we lose the war. Uh, so, uh, you know, Lincoln uh, believed that slavery had always been a threat to the Union, uh, and he also believed that the Civil War was the time to confront it, but it had to be done in a certain way, because if the, if the Civil War is lost, if the Constitution, if the country is lost, you know, slavery would continue to exist. I keep reminding people there are more pe people, there are more enslaved people in the world right now while I'm talking to you than there were when Lincoln was president of the United States. And if this union had broken into five parts, and let's just say that they wouldn't have, slavery would have continued. Slavery might exist on this continent today, on the North American continent today, uh, uh, you know, had, uh, had Lincoln done what some people wanted him to do. And he wanted to do it. But he had to wait, uh, you know, Lincoln had, you know, unlike those people who were giving him advice, and unlike some of his critics, uh, Lincoln had taken an oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. He had taken an oath to preserve the Union. They had not taken that oath. And Lincoln had to live up to that oath and try and figure out, but, but uh, almost from the beginning of the war, he's trying to think of ways to end slavery, and yet at the same time, uh, preserve the Union. And eventually he'll do it. And eventually he'll do it. Um, people say, well, he went too slow. Well, I'm sure if I were a slave under the lash in uh, Alabama in 1861, I would agree that he went too slow. But on the other hand, slavery had existed in this, on this continent for almost, well, for 350 years. And, and, and Lincoln, his policies and the war, the war that he caused, uh, Lincoln and his policies brought that system that had existed for over 300 years to an end in about 36 months. That's pretty rapid. And, and, in the, and in the process, at the same time, he saved, he saved the Union. You can tell I'm a big Lincoln fan. Uh, by the way, Lincoln was a true conservative. He believed in the law. He believed in the law. Uh, anyway, uh, so you never compromise with evil. And uh, he knew that the Civil War was the time to confront slavery head on and destroy it. And that's what he did. He also was a man of vision. He knew where the country needed to go before many in the country realized that. And you see, Aubrey, George Washington was that way, and Winston Churchill was that way, and a host of other people. Uh, they know. Uh, and they don't rule by, by uh, uh, opinion polls. Uh, they, to the best of their ability, try to do what is right, regardless of the personal cost. And this war, you know, cost, Lincoln started this war, and the war cost Lincoln his life. Lincoln, I want you to remember this, was a casualty of the Civil War. When you talk about the toll of dead, 600 or 750,000 or a million, Lincoln is one of those million that died. And of course, Lincoln was a, a risk taker. And I've said to you many times, uh, if you look at someone that's truly great in what they do, don't care what it is, uh, someone that's truly great in what they do, they're risk takers to a degree. So the Civil War settled, and this is where we left off 
I think specifically yesterday, the Civil War settled three great national issues that we had been debating in this country ever since the Constitution Convention. Number one, it ended slavery. Okay, get that down. It ended slavery. Number two, it ended slavery. Number two, it decided once and for all that this would be one nation. You know, there had been an ongoing debate for 80 years as to whether or not secession was legal. The Constitution didn't say anything about it in 1860. It doesn't say anything about secession today. But no state has tried to secede since 1861. Texas, you know, they have a secession movement going on in Texas today, uh, but no state has tried to secede since 1861. That issue was settled, but it was up in the air until the Civil War. And then number three, here's the third thing that the Civil War decided, that the national government, the national government has the right to set national policy. The national government, and you know, we had argued about states' rights. Well, the states have some rights. The states have some rights. But the final say belongs to the national government. We will have elections and we will have debates uh, about the law. But once the elect, this is a republic, once the elected representatives of the people, not the people themselves, but once the elected representatives of the people uh, decide uh, an issue or pass a law, it will be obeyed. It will be obeyed. Just because you lose an election, you do not have the right in the name of states' rights or the rights of the people or we the people to storm the United States Capitol and try and stop an election from being held because your side didn't win. The Civil War decided that. The Civil War decided that. Uh, so, uh, you know, as I said to you, uh, Lincoln never rec recognized secession. Uh, in his view, the South throughout the Civil War, and this surprises people, but even after the Southern states had seceded, uh, in his view, the South was still loyal. As I said to you yesterday, I believe very, Lincoln just viewed that a group of extremists, a group of radicals in the southern states had taken control of 11 states, and the purpose of the war was to remove those radicals and replace them with legitimate elected representatives of the people of Alabama and Virginia and Mississippi and South Carolina. The Constitution did not say anything about secession, but it did define treason, and it says treason is defined as making war against the federal government. And it gave that government, even though it doesn't say a war, the word secession isn't in the Constitution, it gave that government the right to, and I quote, suppress insurrections and rebellions, end quote. And the government had done that. Shay's Rebellion, you recall that, even before there was the United States. Uh, the Continental Congress, Second Continental Congress, suppressed the Shay's Rebellion. And then you have the Whiskey Rebellion, the First Great Rebellion, and George Washington's in our history in George Washington's administration. And then you have the nullification crisis of 1830. Uh, the government had the right to suppress uh, insurrections and rebellions. And on that, Lincoln is going to wage war against the South. Well, the first problem then faced by Lincoln, the day he sworn in as president, was holding U.S. property in the Southern states. Get this down. Seven states had seceded. And there were military bases in all of those states. How many military bases are there in the state of Oklahoma? There's Fort Sill, and there's Tinker Field, and there's uh, Enid Air Force Base, and quite a few. What's that? Is Fort Worth in Oklahoma? No, Fort Worth's in Texas. Uh, the uh, the uh, probably four or five military installations. Well, if Oklahoma seceded. You know, the question would be, who owns that, the state of Oklahoma or the U.S. government? Of course, the answer is the U.S. government owns it, and they'd kick our tails just like they should right back into the Union. Uh, but the fact is, is that that was, that was the big question. There were military bases all over the South. And by the way, when the southern states started seceding, most of the commanders of those military bases simply hauled down the flag and uh, got their garrison together, and they went back, back to the north. But one did not. Okay, one of the forts did not. And it was here uh, in Charleston, South Carolina, okay? And the name of that fort was Fort Sumter. Uh, and spell that correctly, Fort it's Sumter, 
uh, you know, people want to call it Fort Sumner. It's not Fort Sumner. It wasn't. There, there was a Fort Sumner in New Mexico, but Fort Sumter. Okay, Sumter. Is it named after Charles Sumter? Uh, Charles Sumner. Sumter. Oh, right. Charles Sumner. No. Uh, I think there. Were, well, anyway, I don't. I'd have to look it up. But I, I think there was an Edward Sumner. But I think he was killed at the Battle of Antietam. Anyway. Uh, that may be the guy, but uh, anyway, it's not Fort. There wasn't Fort Sumter, but that's not the one we're talking about. We're talking about Fort Sumter, South Carolina, and Fort Sumter was, uh, you know, right here. Uh, look, right there uh, in Charleston Harbor, and there's a close up of Charleston Harbor, <coughs> and there were <coughs> several forts, and they had been built there to protect in case there was a. <clears throat> for an invasion. You might recall during the Revolutionary War, in the final year of the Revolutionary War, the British did invade Char whoops, the British did invade Charleston and take it. So anyway, that those forts were there, and there's Fort Sumter, roughly right out of the center of Charleston Harbor. And it was commanded by this man, writing down Robert Anderson, who by the way was a Southerner. He was a Kentuckian, just like Abraham Lincoln and Jefferson Davis. He was a Kentuckian. And by the way, he was a slave owner. But unlike Jefferson Davis, uh, he remained loyal to the Union. And he was an Army officer, but he was in command. He had 68 men uh, out there at Fort Sumter, uh, 68, uh, 68 Marines. And there is what Fort Sumter looked like in 1861. Fort Sumter looked like in 1861. It was three stories tall. During the Civil War, uh, the North is going to attack it and level off the first two stories. And if you go to it today, uh, there it is today. Okay, and if you're ever in Charleston, it's just a 20 minute ferry ride. Go out there and go see it. Go stand in the spot. You know, I like to stand in the spot where history happened. Go stand in the spot where our nation's bloodiest war began, Fort Sumter. But you see, the top two stories are, are whittled off of it now. Okay, but anyway, uh, Robert Anderson was out there with 68 Marines. Uh, this fort was three stories tall, it was quite formidable. It uh, had walls 50 feet tall taller than this building that you're in, 50 feet tall, and the walls were five feet thick, okay, five feet thick, so it's pretty uh, formidable. And, of course, it commanded, really, the South's most important harbor. Uh, but South Carolina, though, had seceded, and uh, South Carolina had ringed this entire harbor with guns, and all those guns were concentrated at uh, Fort Sumter. Uh, and the Confederate, get him down, the Confederate commander of those, uh, this is interesting, the, the Confederate commander of those guns surrounding the harbor was this man, General Pierre Gustave Touton Beauregard. General Beauregard, he was a Louisiana Cajun, okay? And he commanded all those shore batteries that had Robert Anderson surrounded. When Beauregard, though, here's the end, one of the interesting things, when Beauregard was at West Point, West Point becoming an army officer. Robert Anderson, the man that he now had surrounded, you know, here are all these big siege guns pointing at Robert Anderson. When Beauregard was at West Point, Robert Anderson was his artillery instructor, okay? Taught him how to fire big guns. So now the pupil or the student had the teacher, the uh, teacher surrounded. And the Confederate government was demanding that, that uh, Anderson surrender. They said, we cannot, I mean, you know, look, if you say that the United States is an independent nation, uh, and yet, uh, I don't know, let me pick a country, Vietnam can build a military base in Los Angeles Harbor, and there's nothing we can do about it. And we may say we're an independent country. We may have a flag. We may have an army. We may have a Congress and a Constitution. We may have elections. But if we can't protect our own borders, we're not a legitimate country. Uh, and that was the situation the South found itself in. Uh, and so the Confederates, the Confederacy was demanding that Robert Anderson surrender that fort and turn it over to them. And they would send people out in boats, they would row out and they would have these conversations. And Anderson offered the same excuse every time. He said, look, I don't want to start a war, but I can't, I can't turn this fort over to you until I receive orders from my commander in chief. And who is his commander in chief? Abraham Lincoln. Okay. So, uh, and this is all happening, by the way, while Lincoln is waiting to become president. Well, just before, get this down, just before James Buchanan, James Buchanan is the lame duck president, 
He's just waiting for Lincoln to take office. Uh, Lincoln will take office on my, you can make yourself a little timeline. Lincoln will uh, take office on March 5th, 1861. On January 8th, Buchanan's still president, 1861, Buchanan tried to resupply the fort. You gotta get this down. You can try to resupply the fort. He sent a ship down there, get this down, called the USS Star of the West. The Star of the West. It had troops and it had supplies. And the purpose of this ship was to land at Fort Sumter and resupply the fort. And when the ship entered into, when the ship entered into Charleston Harbor, the ship comes in heading for Fort Sumter, Get this down, Confederate shore batteries fired on it. Didn't tell anybody, hit the ship. <clears throat> didn't tell anybody, didn't hit the ship. No damage, but the Star of the West turned around and went back north. Right there, get this, they fired, that, right there is the, are the opening shots of the Civil War. The Star of the West went back to New York. Those are the opening shots of the war. The flag had been fired upon. You should be saying, well, it's Fort Sumter. And what did Buchanan do? Nothing. Nothing. He said, it's awful, but he did nothing. And he simply sits there and waits until Lincoln takes office. Well, Lincoln had been in office less than 30 days when the situation at Fort Sumter was growing more tense by the hour. This is Lincoln's first great crisis as president. So like any good leader, he consulted his cabinet. And the question was this. He said, should we turn over the fort to the Confederacy or keep it and risk war? And he had seven cabinet members and four out of the seven. Um, by the way, I just want to point this out. Four of the seven men that Lincoln had point, appointed to his cabinet had opposed Lincoln. They had run against Lincoln for the Republican nomination for president. And people have often said, why would he appoint all of his political enemies to his cabinet? Well, there are a couple of theories on that. One says, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. In her wonderful book, um, uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin, her book is got, I think maybe in our library, it's called Team of Rivals. You want to know how to run a, gov a government or a company or a corporation? Uh, that book has a lot of good hints. But Doris Kearns Goodwin makes the point that some presidents, some leaders, generals in the army, corporate leaders, they surround themselves with suck-ups, with sycophants. Uh, Douglas MacArthur is a perfect example of one. MacArthur, he filled his staff with people who thought that they could rise to the top by sucking up to Douglas MacArthur, and everything MacArthur said was almost like a word of God. Uh, they never criticized him. They never questioned him. They never contradicted him. They just constantly sat around the table, and they praised uh, everything that MacArthur did. And that led, and I don't have time to tell you, know, I, some of you have already told how that happened, but that led MacArthur to a disaster, okay? And he ended up getting fired by the President of the United States because he thought uh, he was untouchable. He thought he was perfect. All of his decisions were correct and true, yes. Did he just want to nuke the Chinese? Well, he wanted to use nuclear weapons, and he wanted to have Shanghai check. He wanted to have Taiwan invade. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, anyway, yeah, it was a disaster. It would have never worked. I mean, like my God. Huh? Sounds like a good plan. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what Truman enough. said right before he said goodbye, you're fired. <laughs> but the, the whole time, there was not that one single voice. You know, and of course, and, and just think about today. You know, if you're sitting in a meeting and you say, well, you know, I don't think, you know, people will turn and look at you and say, well, don't be negative. Okay. Well, Churchill was pretty negative when he was trying to warn, warn the world while Neville Chamberlain was standing down in the House of Commons saying, all is well, all is well. This is peace in our time. And Churchill was trying to say, we're courting the greatest war in history, and we were. He was pretty damn negative, okay? I'm just saying there's a time for negativity. You shouldn't be an obstructionist. You shouldn't be against just to be against. Uh, but there's a time to speak your mind. And wise leaders put people in their cabinet and their corporation just like that. Well, that's what Lincoln did. And by the way, that's what Churchill did. Uh, uh, and that's, by the way, what George Washington did. Uh, men that we look at, uh, and women that we look at as great leaders, that's what they do. Uh, you know, Churchill and Lincoln, for example, both led their nations in the most critical moments, you could argue, of their nation's history. And their cabinets were filled with opponents who regularly said to them, you're wrong. Lincoln had stormy cabinet meetings. You ought to read the minutes of some of Churchill's meetings with his war cabinet. People got up and banged the table and threatened to resign, and some stormed out of the room. Uh, 
but it was an honest, open debate, and usually, not every time, but usually, they arrived at the right course to take. Listen, it takes no courage. It takes no strength to surround yourself with people that are yes men and yes women. George Washington, at the most critical hour of the, maybe in the history of this nation, put two people who despised each other in his cabinet. Uh, Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson and watched them go with each other like uh, 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 feist dogs uh, bark and snarl at each other. And from their debate, uh, he usually was able to discern the proper course, the proper course. And so that's what Lincoln had here. And when he, when he asked them, what should we do? Some of them said we should keep the fort and risk war and risk war. And others said we should not. Excuse me just a minute. Hello? Hello? So some of them advised him to keep the fort in risk war, and some of them said, no, it's not worth it. And in a week, he held the second cabinet meeting, and only Seward, this time only Seward, said, uh, don't give up the fort. Okay? So it's about six to one. And his advisors don't give up the fort. Well, Lincoln made the final decision. You can have advice, but great leaders are capable of making a decision. And Lincoln knew, listen to me, Lincoln knew that as long as the United States government had that fort in the heart of the South, Lincoln knew that secession was not a fact. The whole world was watching. And as long as the United States could maintain a fort in the Confederacy, the Confederacy was not the Confederacy. Look, to be a nation, you must control your borders. He also knew that the only way to save the nation uh, was a war. He knew that a war had to start. He also knew that the only way to save or destroy slavery, excuse me, was to have a war. And so here's Lincoln's problem. We got this now. And he knows there has to be a war. And he's going to start it. That's an awesome, awesome, awesome responsibility. And he's going to start it. But his, his, Lincoln's problem is this. How do we start, how do I start this war and make it look like the South started it? How do I really start the war and trick the South into firing, into firing the first shot? So that the South will be the aggressors, not us. So Lincoln forced the issue. Put this down. Lincoln forced the issue. The whole world is watching to see whether the South can pull off secession. The whole world is watching to see whether or not the South is a legitimate uh, nation, to see if secession is legitimate. Uh, and again, Lincoln is the master of the situation. Get this down. Here's what he does. Okay, here's how here's how he tricks the South into firing the first shot. And it's very important in a war as to who fires the first shot. So again, Lincoln is the master of the situation. Here's what he did. The governor of South Carolina, you don't have to write this guy's name down. To write this down, the governor of South Carolina was a man named Pickens. Governor Pickens. And Lincoln wrote him a letter. And he said, pretty simple, he said, I'm going to reinforce Fort Sumter. He didn't say I'm going to attack. He didn't say I'm going to shoot at you. He didn't say, I'm going to inaugurate a war. He simply said, I'm sending troops, ammunition, and supplies, food, medicine, down to Fort Sumter, and stopped at that. Well, what happens if South Carolina, or the Confederacy, if you will, uh, lets Fort Sumter be resupplied? What does that say? They can't defend their borders. And so if they can't defend their borders, they are... Not really valid. They're not a real independent country. <laughs> That's exactly true. And what happens if they fire on Fort Sumter? They're the aggressors. aggressors. They're the aggressors, and they've just given Lincoln excuse. the excuse to do what? Send troops to the start a war. Start. Yeah. Which is what Lincoln, will you see that? This is win win for Lincoln. He's the master of the situation, as he most generally always was. He's the master, although he said, I plan to. Can confess that I have not controlled events. Events have controlled me. So that's Lincoln's own words. But anyway, I say he's the master of the situation. 
Uh, and uh, of course, if Fort Sumter was fired on by the Confederacy, Lincoln would be justified in waging war according to the Constitution because the South would have committed treason. What Lincoln did is he put the ball squarely in the South's court. Regardless of what happened now, uh, Lincoln, the United States, the North, whatever you want to call it, they were the winner. Well, the Confederate commander uh, in Charleston, the uh, Beauregard, on April the 11th, sent men out to Fort Sumter one last time, and he gave Anderson an ultimatum on April the 11th, 1861. He said, if you're not out of here by tomorrow, if you do not evacuate the fort by the 12th of April, we will blast you out of that fort. And in a final meeting, a group of Confederate officers and Union officers stood there uh, on the, at the base of Fort Sumter, and they shook hands. And the Confederates uh, get in their boat and go back to Charleston, and Anderson and his people go back in the fort and shut the gates. And of course, Anderson, Beauregard knew this. I mean, you know, what moved Beauregard to do this? And Beauregard and the Confederates knew that Anderson was just stalling for time <laughs> and reinforcements. Anderson actually told them this, there's no need to start a shooting war over this because we're going to be out of food any day now and we'll be forced to turn over the fort anyway. But they didn't believe him, nor should they have, because he's simply stalling for reinforcements. Well, at 4.30 in the morning, get this down, 4.30 in the morning, <coughs> pardon me, on April 12th, 1861, that's the date I want you to remember, it's the day the war began. All of Charleston was asleep. Well, most of Charleston was asleep. And a lone cannon, a lone cannon, fired by, I don't know if I've got his picture up here, not him. Whoops. Well, this is a good, oh, this guy, I wonder what he's doing. Uh, there's the flag that flew over Fort Sumter during the attack. Uh, there's a cannon looking out from Fort Sumter. Uh, there it is. Okay, big guns. Uh, this man, you don't have to write him down, but it's an interesting story. Edmund Ruffin. Edmund Ruffin was a <clears throat> Virginian. And of course, at this point, Virginia had not seceded. But for 30 years, he had, he had wanted the South to secede and form a confederacy. And when South Carolina finally seceded, he was just so overjoyed that he went to South Carolina and became a citizen of South Carolina. And of course, he was an old man. He was in his 70s. And he had this long white hair. And of course, he's just almost received as a hero. They have dinners in his honor. And he's just becomes quite a man about town. And when they finally decided to fire on Fort Sumter and start the war, they gave him the honor of firing the first shot. And so at 4.30 a.m. in the morning, April 12, 1861, um, most of Charleston's asleep, uh, Edmund Ruffin pulled the lanyard on a cannon. And this shell just goes out over Charleston Harbor. Just here's Fort Sumter. It didn't hit the fort. It hovers above the fort and just explodes. Boom! You know, the whole shattered glasses in Charleston Harbor woke people up. People jumped out of their beds. They ran to their rooftops. They took their binoculars. What the heck is going on? This explosion and the shooting started. For a long time, the troops in Fort Sumter didn't answer back, uh, but it lit up the entire harbor. Uh, America's bloodiest war, the Civil War, had begun. By the way, just to put a cap on Edmund Ruffin, after this, of course, after Fort Sumter shelled, Lincoln sent a call for 75,000 troops to invade the South, the Upper South. Virginia, Tennessee, Arkansas, uh, and uh, North Carolina will secede. And when Virginia secedes, he's so happy he goes back home and he stays there for the four years of the war. And on April 9th, 1865, he receives the word that Lee had surrendered to Grant and the war was over. The Confederacy had lost and he was so distraught that he goes into his study, drapes the Confederate flag around his shoulder, 
sits down in a rocking chair uh, with the, uh, the the muzzle of a double barrel shotgun in his mouth and tripped the trigger with his toe and blew his head off. So that was the end of him. I guess you could say he fired the first shot and the last shot of the war. Anyway, uh, that's what happens to Edwin, Edwin Ruffin. Well, Anderson held out, got this down for 33 hours. They shell Fort Sumter for 33 hours, and here's the, you know, there's, you know, that's what it would have looked like, the Confederates firing at the fort. Yeah, there's the fort out in the middle of the harbor being shelled. Uh, there it is in color, okay? 33 hours, they shot it out. Nobody was killed on either side. Get this down. As one historian said, this was a bloodless opening to America's bloodiest war. And, quote, well, well, almost. Uh, at, on the 14th, when Anderson finally surrenders, he's loading his men in boats to go back to New York, uh, and he's going to lower the American flag one more time. And they were going to fire a salute as the flag came down the flagpole. And here was some poor little private who had survived two days of shelling out there at Fort Sumter. And he was going to fire a final salute when the flag came down. And when he did, instead of going out in front of the cannon, the gun misfired and the cannonball came up through the top and killed him. Okay. So, you know, talk about bad luck. He survived the battle, but then he's killed firing a salute to the nation's flag. So I guess there was one casualty, but it was almost a bloodless opening to America's bloodiest war okay well and by the way four years later the north will recapture fort sumter and uh, anderson is taken down uh, robert anderson is taken down to fort sumter with the original flag that he had hauled down the one i just showed you and he's allowed to raise it over for the stars and stripes over fort sumter one more time so after 40 years of arguing and debating uh, the southern attack on Fort Sumter started the war. And I want you to write this down. This attack on Fort Sumter had the same impact on the American people that Pearl Harbor would later have, or 9-11 would later have on the American people. The South had fired upon the flag. You know, for 40 years we'd been ar we'd argued about slavery. Get this down. All of a sudden, when the South fires on Fort Sumter, slavery is going to be pushed to the back burner. Now people are screaming, they have attacked the country, they have attacked the flag, they have attacked the Union, and we must suppress the rebellion. The South has committed treason. And in fact, 100,000 people gathered in Union Square in New York City uh, to watch Robert Anderson uh, make a speech, and there's a, there's a, there was a great equestrian statue of George Washington up there, Washington on a horse, and they draped the flag from Fort Sumter over George Washington's statue of the horse, and he gave this fiery, fiery speech. Fury swept the nation, uh, just like it did after Pearl Harbor. Uh, and Lincoln immediately called. Now he had his war. And Lincoln immediately called, get this down, for 75,000 volunteers to serve for 90 days to put down the rebellion. By the way, Congress was not even in session. He, and Lincoln declared war himself. He didn't even ask Congress's permission. And again, these soldiers were called to serve for three months because everybody believes that it's going to be going to be a short war. It's not just going to be a short war. People on both sides believe that there's going to be one battle. Uh, somewhere, the North and the South are going to meet, and they're going to fight for a day, and whoever wins that battle wins the war. If the South wins, they're an independent country. If the North wins, the South will rejoin the Union. Well, of course, Jefferson Davis did not want to be outdone. Lincoln had called for 75,000 volunteers. Jefferson Davis calls for 100,000, and he got them. 100,000 people come forward. So many people came forward, get this down, so many people showed up that a third of them, on both sides, a third of them had to be sent home because they didn't have, a kind of, they didn't have enough food, they didn't have uh, supplies, uniforms, boots, guns, all the things you need for an army. So they were told to go home, we'll call you when we need you. When Lincoln announced that he was raising an army to send an army through the South to force uh, the Deep South back into the Union, and I just mentioned this a while ago, four other Southern states seceded. You have four other Southern states. The Upper South, Arkansas, Tennessee, Virginia, and North Carolina. Arkansas, Tennessee, Virginia, and North Carolina. And when Virginia seceded, when Virginia seceded, there's Fort Sumter the day after the battle. Okay, you see the Confederate flag flying over it. And you see the damage. And there's some Southern officials inspecting the damage. 
There's a flag again that flew, that's in the Smithsonian that flew over Fort Sumter. And then, of course, there it is again today. We've got the out here, you just walk in. There's a little shot of it. Uh, these four states joined the Confederacy, and that gives the Confederacy a total of 11 states. 11 states, okay? <clears throat> when Virginia seceded, what was the original capital of the Confederacy? Montgomery. Uh, Montgomery. Montgomery. Jefferson Davis was sworn in in Montgomery, Alabama. But when Virginia seceded, okay, they moved the capital, get this down, and the permanent capital became Richmond, Virginia. And people say, well, why? Richmond was older, it was more cosmopol cosmopolitan, uh, it was more urban. You know, Montgomery was just, a, in those days, a rough frontier town. So they moved the uh, capital of the Confederacy up uh, to uh, uh, Richmond. And like I say, more sophisticated, more cosmopolitan. And so in the final count, the Confederacy will have 11 states. By the way, Oklahoma was a Confederate territory. We actually, uh, Indian Territory actually got to send uh, delegates to the Confederate Congress in Richmond, Virginia. But two armies were formed. They're both armies of 90-day wonders. That's what they call them. Uh, and there they are. One army has surrounded Richmond. The other has surrounded, you see that red square, Washington, D.C., uh, and they're 90 miles apart, and both sides are staring at one another. The war had come so suddenly that neither side really had a plan. The South is determined at this point to play defense. Uh, many people said, we're just going to sit here and see if the North has enough guts to attack, most of them believe uh, they don't. Uh, the Union really, you know, the, the Southerners believe that uh, they were going to be able to walk out of this Union in a bloodless coup because they believe that the North did not have uh, enough courage to fight. And number two, even if they had enough courage to fight, they weren't going to fight over the Union. They said they've been talking about the Union all these years, but now that push has come to shove, they're going to have to die for the Union. Uh, they don't believe in the Union that much. Uh, but, uh, you know, also in the North, on the other hand, uh, all sorts of armchair generals, in other words, people who didn't have the responsibility of commanding the army, they were just in the army, they start coming up with plans of what they ought to do. Uh, and um, I'm talking about newspaper editors, politicians, uh, they began to demand that Lincoln, do, being under Andrew Jackson, raise an army, go down and force the South back in the Union, you are wasting time. Well, Lincoln is now commander-in-chief, and he didn't know anything about the military. Someone asked him once, what military experience do you have? And he was in the Black Hawk War when he was a young man for about three or four months. And they asked him, did you shed any blood in the Black Hawk War? And Lincoln, who was always good for a joke, said, yes, a mosquito bit me while I was in the militia. But that's about it. And now he finds himself in command of the North's war effort. So, uh, guess what he did? He walked across, uh, well, down the street, not across the street, down the street from the White House to the Library of Congress, and he checked out all sorts of mil books on uh, military strategy. And guess what? He, taught, he read those books. He studied those books. He taught himself the art of warfare, and he becomes a pretty good general himself. And you're going to see, I mean, if you ever get on a course where you go through the entire war, uh, Lincoln almost, it took him until the last, the final months of the war, almost said the last year, it took him until the final months of the war to finally find a general who could win it for him, and that was Grant. But Lincoln went through disappointment after disappointment with generals who were boastful and who bragged and who said, well, thrashed, and of course Lee uh, whipped almost every one of them. Okay, uh, finally, who does he find? The man, who, today we say, the man who saved America. Grant, okay, Grant, and Grant will win the war for him. Well, meanwhile, in addition to checking out these books, Lincoln will uh, go to the War Department, okay? Get this down, he goes to the War Department, and the, uh, the um, and he talks to the senior general, in the United States Army, and that general was Winfield Scott. Let's see if I've got a picture of Scott up here. There he is. You see, Scott was, he was 75 years old. He was an old man. He was so frail he couldn't mount a horse anymore. 
he was a Virginian. He was a slave. He's Southern. He's a slave owner. I think I probably told you the story. And Lincoln asked him, who do you recommend to command our army? We're going to war. And without a moment's hesitation, uh, Scott uh, recommended his fellow slave owning Virginian, Robert E. Lee. And so Lincoln said, call Lee into the War Department and uh, offer him the command. And he did. And he did. And uh, Scott told him, I've been authorized by the president to offer you command of the United States Army. And Lee refused. He said, say the defense of my native state, I hope never again to draw my sword. And the two men stood up and shook hands. And Scott told him, he said, Lee, you will, you will regret this decision until the day you die. And with that, Lee went home. Virginia had not yet seceded. Lee left the Army. He was a 30-year U.S. Army man. He had been the Commandant of West Point Military Academy. Uh, and he went home to Virginia to wait and see what happened. And when Virginia finally secedes after the shelling of, uh, when, when Virginia finally secedes, they have a big debate. A lot of Virginians are against secession. States going to split over into Virginia and West Virginia. But when Virginia finally seceded, uh, Lee offered his services, and he's not put in command of troops. And I tell students this, as, as brilliant as he was in the war, Lee had never commanded troops in battle until the Civil War. But he becomes a staff officer. They bring him to Richmond, and he's up there with Jefferson Davis as a staff officer planning the war until about 1862, and uh, when Joseph E. Johnston gets the command commander of the Confederate Army in 1862, Joseph E. Johnston is defeated during the Peninsula Campaign, and then with the enemy 20 miles from Richmond, they call Lee. Lee's got about 60,000 men, the enemy has twice that many, and he drives them back down the Peninsula, saves the Confederacy, and of course, as they say, and the rest is history. He will command the Confederate Army in the Eastern Theater of the War, which was the Army of Northern Virginia. He will command it until he surrenders it on April 9th, 1865 at Appomattox Courthouse to Ulysses Grant. Well, when we come back, we will take it up there. You done with ties again? Huh? I said you're done with ties for the year? Ties? Yeah, we got a bow tie now. Long ties? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>